Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Lee Pinkowitz. I am uh, on the finance faculty here and also the associate director of student engagement for the uh, Center for Financial Markets and Policy. And uh, we are incredibly pleased uh, and, and honored to, uh, to have George here live uh, to, give this, uh, to give this talk. Um, while I actually would say you don't need an introduction, I believe Tom is going to introduce oh, you. Fine. So <laughs> going to do an introduction after so, 40 so years. I've known this guy 40, 42 years. years? Yeah. Too long. So George and I were second year students, uh, graduate students at Wharton. And one day we both had interviews in New York City. We got the train together and we started to talk about our careers. And George was interviewing uh, with a cell side uh, research department. He told me, I'm not gonna go to that place. I'm just doing this interview. I wanna learn more about research, but I'm not gonna take this job even if they offer it to me. What I'm gonna take is a job that I was offered uh, to this mutual fund uh, company in Boston. I worked for him last summer and I worked for this guy who offered me a job. And he runs the biggest mutual fund in the world. And he asked me to go join him. I'm going to go do that. And um, that really started George Noble's uh, storied career. Uh, he went to Fidelity, 1981. Uh, and for three years, he learned at the knee of Peter Lynch, who at the time not only was the biggest mutual fund manager, but was considered to have the best 10 year record in the world. Um, in 1984, Fidelity asked George. Uh, to manage the Fidelity Overseas Fund. Uh, it was their first international product. And during the first year in operation, the fund was the number one performer in the world. Um, just think about the, that. Don't confuse brains with a bull market. <laughs> well, sometimes it's a bear market. With people mm -hmm. part of it. I'll talk about it later. Um, over his, his seven year tenure, uh, the, the overseas fund ranked first in performance of international funds and second in performance of all mutual funds. Now think about that for seven years, that's 866 funds in the liver analytics population. And think about that further. How many times do you think in your career, you're gonna have a third party that's gonna recognize you to be the best at something in the world? pretty extraordinary. And G George did all this before the age of 34. He then went on to start his first hedge fund, which we'll talk about why he made that move. Uh, it's called Teton Partners. And I reminded him recently that during the period from 91 to 96, he actually had a third of my net liquid net worth that he was managing. Sure. And he told me, don't give me any more. But uh, he returned the funds in 96, spent more time with his family. And we all had a very nice return during that period of time. Um, in 2005, he launched another hedge fund, which he then uh, returned capital in 2009. Uh, and he did something which has been my experience with George all along. He's always ahead of the curve. He started a family office at that time. And if you look at what happened to most of the successful hedge funds over the next 10 years, they all moved to the family office structure. With that, George Noble. Next time. We would like this to be interactive, so certainly feel free to raise your hand. Interrupt. And, 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 I don't like giving a monologue. Okay. All you, Although all you. Um, I've discovered a second career uh, as a Twitter uh, podcaster, and I'm, I've got the gift of gab. So if you don't interrupt me, I'm going to keep talking. Um, thanks for having me here. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Hendricks. First time to Georgetown. Um, if you were to ask me, say Georgetown, what would I, what would my visceral reaction be? I mean, I have, I have a lot of friends who graduated from this fine institution, but I actually don't like this place. And the reason is, I think it was 1989. I'm trying to remember. I was a huge Princeton basketball fan, and uh, in the NIT championship with Patrick Ewing, they beat Princeton. So I've held that against Georgetown ever, ever to this day. Um, I'd like to start out. I have plenty of things to talk about. I'm reliably informed that I talk a bit too much. So, but I, I first like to get a sense of what's on your mind. Um, I've got tons of slides, tons of topics to talk about. We have limited time. 
So I'd like to speak to what are some of the areas of interest um, for any of you. So feel free to raise your hand if you've got anything you want me to answer in particular. Um, if not, I'm just gonna do my thing. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, show of hands, anyone? Okay. You just have to go with the topic now. You don't have to Yeah, just, just I'll, I'll speak to it. Okay. Well, <laughs> Not happening. You're going to get me started. The Fed can't produce more oil. The Fed can't grow more wheat, but that's a whole other discussion. Anyone else? That's debatable. <laughs> well, to you, to you. You know, it's a very timely question, but um, we, may, we may actually start with that one first. I like that one. Um, anyone else? Just piggybacking off of that, what you call the 60 portfolio debt? DOA. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're going to start. I'm going to show you two um, clips before we start it. Um, so I was very fortunate to have um, started my career at Fidelity Investments uh, for Peter Lynch. And, um, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. and I was taught by the best. And one of Peter's signature um, lines, probably what he's the most famous for, is know what you want. And you know, the stock market's not a game. There's a reason certain prices go up over the long run on average, not every day, not every week. This funny little thing called earnings. And if you look at a long-term chart for individual stock, you look at the earnings line, you look at the stock line, stock price line, up until the last few years, usually there's a pretty good correlation between the two. Um, and so, you know, there's a reason people will speak to the listen to what I put So uh, I'm going to show you two clips, one from Peter, and then from a one from a modern day trader who was interviewed on CNBC. So yep. with that, okay. So that's what I want to talk about, and the single, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason, <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. It's a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicon emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, a token ring interchange backplane, and it does it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful with their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get to consume reports, they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on apartments. When they go to 
When they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide, or California, when they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock, and they'll put half their life savings <laughs> in it before sunset, and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions and program trading. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. And that's what we were being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. Now, we're going to go to Mark Minervini. This is on CNBC from last fall. See the notes are different. Putting money in right now include Upstart, that is one, uh, Tesla, MGM, and AIG. Why those four, all of which you've bought within, well, basically this week, except Tesla, uh, end of last month? Yeah, so, well, Upstart's up about 25% just in four days since we, since we bought it. We bought it on uh, about four days ago. Uh, so that's actually made a, a nice little move in the uh, short term, probably a little extended right now, but longer term, uh, that, that's a, that's a, a good-looking uh, name. Uh, very powerful, very strong earnings. These stocks are What do they do? Really I don't well. even know them. What do they do? Uh, excuse me? What does Upstart do? Uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. What kind of company is it? Yeah, I'm not, you're, you're breaking up. Oh, uh, well, sorry I guess we, we've got an audio problem there, Mark. I'm sorry. I do know MGM, I do know Tesla, and I do know AIG, but a 25% move in a week is pretty good for the company Upstart. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your time. We'll have you back soon. This is what passes for investing these days. Um, I must confess to the number of years in the last uh, few that I felt like a fish out of water. Um, not like any stock market I knew. And that's because the Fed kind of broke the stock market by printing too much money. But this is all in the process of coming unwound. We'll get to that. All right. I don't want this to stay up here very long, but because Tom, I, I want to talk about the downside of this. Um, this is a very personal thing, but I was very fortunate when I started managing money that Ellie did not have a foreign stock fund. And in December of 84, they started one. And I was a guy. And yeah, you know, I work hard and I'm smart, but dollar was going down in bull markets around the world. And I think I was up 78% or something. Yeah, 73 after the lows. So they actually had lows back in the day. You had to pay like a 3% sales charge, believe it or not, to buy the fund. It was up 78% that year. Um, and so I was kind of a wonderkind of Fidelity. That was great. And I went on to start a couple of hedge funds, as Tom mentioned. Um, and it was interesting because we're going to talk about long short versus long only investing. My first hedge fund I started because I was heavily invested in the Japanese stock market in the 80s. And to be young again, I actually believed what I was doing. Um, no. Um, and you probably all read in the, in, the, in, in, in the books about how Japan had you know, the biggest real estate bubble in the history of the world. The Emperor's Palace was worth more than the entire state of California, so on and so forth. Well, I was on that, I, I was on that train for a while. Uh, and then when the bubble broke, when the bubble popped, I wanted to start a hedge fund to take advantage of it, to go short. And I can remember um, Christmas week, just before I resigned, I found myself in Ned Johnson's office, who, by the way, he passed away a couple weeks ago, in case you didn't see that. Um, his memorial service is this Thursday. And um, he said, George, this is a great idea. There's only one problem. You can't do it here. Because if the public finds out we're shorting stocks, it's not for the optics company to be very good. So that's when I left to start my first hedge fund. Um, people say, well, what happened to you? Why did you close it? Did you blow up? No, um, we had a personal matter. My wife had cancer actually, so that's why we closed it. And then a few years later, uh, in 2005, we started another one. I should mention the first hedge fund, the main idea was to short the Japanese stock market, which was a novel idea at the time. 
The second hedge fund I started in 2005. I'm sort of like joke with Tom, he's a Yankees fan. I'm sort of a Billy Martin of hedge fund managers. I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out. Um, I think I just showed my age because I don't know. Yeah, how, many, really, how many people in this room even know who Billy Martin is? Okay, well, that that is a tell. All right, yeah. so, Tom, <laughs> so Tom, Tom, you have to give them a little Yankee baseball history. He was one of the all time Yankee greats. Um, he was fiery. He was, he was second base. I can't remember what he played. Second baseman, he was a manager. He got fired and quit a bunch of times. He kept coming back. So, anyway, that's what that joke was intended to, to do. Anyway, I started another hedge fund in 2005. So enough of that. I want to show you this. I um, had a good run with this fund. Um, I think in, we started in 05, and I think in 07, we were up 78%. In 08, which was a horrible year, and everyone was down like 30%. We we're only down one. Because we had a lot of shorts, but we also had some longs. And I was kind of annoyed with myself. I should have done better, but whatever. So I did really well. I was up 78 and it was only down one. And then what happened was in 2009, I became, I got bullish, but I got bullish too early. I got bullish in January of 09. And the market didn't bottom until March. And I was kind of a one man band. I had a team with me, but I wasn't very good at uh, delegating things or I hired the wrong people or, and I was a control enthusiast. I was a guy in the national car rental commercial, All right. So in any event, um, I was really burned out. And the next thing you know, we were down like 25%. And, you know, I, I work hard, I make mistakes, but I think I'm honest and I'm not totally stupid. And people usually have confidence in if they have confidence in their manager. And that's one of the things about markets. We're going to get to long, short versus versus long only in a second. And that is sometimes the market makes you look dumber than you really are. And sometimes it makes you look smarter than you really are. Um, there's a fellow, Michael Guyad, who you should follow if you're on Twitter, um, the lead lag report. He has this great line, um, there are no gurus, there are only cycles. And that's true. And it's funny because when you're doing really well, people think you're really smart and want to give you more money, but they may be coming exactly at the time when you don't have any more good ideas because all your ideas worked. And then there are times when, you know, you got a bad break, you're out, you your own value stocks and growth stocks are going up, whatever. And everyone wants to take their money away from you. And that's usually a good contrary indicator. I can tell a funny story about that, but we'll never go on to both. It's all discussion. At any rate, um, I closed the fund in 09 because I just, I was burned out. And actually, when I look back at my career, it's probably a very bad decision because I had a tremendous amount of goodwill with my investors because I thought I'd done a pretty good job. So anyway, the point is, you know, it's the same guy, the guy who closed this fund in 09 and the guy who was up 78% in 07 and who ran the number one international mutual fund for seven years at Fidelity. It's the same guy. But market giveth and the market taketh away. Um, okay, so let's go to the topic before the house. So why a hedge fund as opposed to, or not why a hedge fund, how is managing a hedge fund different from managing real money? I've done both, I've run a mutual fund and I've run hedge funds. Hedge fund is really a misnomer. It covers a multitude of sins. It can be guys just, you know, have a hunch, buy a bunch, strap it on, get 200% long, buy AMC or whatever nonsense you want. Then there are guys who are trying to pick up nickels in front of steamrollers and they're never gonna lose you money because they're always bunting, to use the baseball analogy, but they're never, gonna, they're, ne they're never gonna make much money. And there's everything in between, guys buying legal claims on things, whatever, all right? So a hedge fund is a real catch-all misnomer. You gotta be careful when you, when you use that word. But when you're running a hedge fund, the idea is really to pursue absolute returns not relative returns. I can't remember who coined the phrase, um, you can't eat relative bread. I remember, I think it was 1989, the Fidelity Overseas Fund was down 6%, but I got a big bonus, why? I think the index I was competing against, don't hold me to this, it's, it's accuracy, not precision that I'm concerned with here. I think the index was down like 20 or something like that, and I was down six. And it was really pretty simple. All you had to do was avoid Japan. And just index everything else, it would have been fine. You didn't know that when the year started, but that's the way it actually turned out. So I beat the index convincingly, and I also beat most of my competitors by a wide margin. But I still lost 6%. And that actually, that was the year that kind of gave me the bug to want to start a hedge fund. So I'm like, you know what? The best investment idea out there right now is that Japan's going to collapse. It's not Germany's going to go up or the UK is good or I want to own, you know, Argentinian agricultural stocks or whatever. 
that Japan's going to crash. Japan was the nail standing up. And so if you're running relative money, you just say, okay, underweight Japan. But great, so you're, you're up, you're down six, the index is down 20. I wanted to make money out of that. And so I started a fund to short, started a fund to short the Japanese market. The thing you got to keep in mind though, when you're shorting, I remember Julian Robinson um, said a few years ago, Julian Robinson, used to be shorting stocks was a license to uh, make money because not too many people did it. And it was, um, pretty you know there wasn't a lot of competition so it's pretty inefficient and you want to go where there's less competition but what's happened with the proliferation of hedge funds in the last couple of decades is that an awful lot of people want to short stocks and it's hard enough finding good long ideas finding good short ideas can even be more difficult because you know most companies are okay and they have good managements and you think about their incentives the managers trying to have the company have higher sales and earnings so you're really betting against management if you do this. So in any event, there's a, there's a much smaller universe of good short ideas out there. And when you have a lot of people focusing on that fishbowl, you get a lot of crowded shorts, you gotta be careful. Unless you find something that's really terminal, saying Enron, most shorts are trades, they're not investments. So a company blows a quarter, let's just say you're shorting something because you think it's gonna, you know, you're going to miss the quarter. Okay, they missed the quarter. Fine, the stock goes down. That's assuming not every, that's assuming all the other wise guys hadn't shorted it already because it might go up actually when they have the bad numbers. That's a whole other story. But the point is that's a, that's a, that's a trade. It's not an investment. Whereas when you're on the long side, the best thing is if you can find a stock that keeps on giving, you find a compound. I don't want to say one decision stock because that's, that's a license to lose money, but there's usually positive serial correlation in companies' results in, in, in their stock price. So company, you know, if you're Walmart or Home Depot or whatever, you just keep on, or Microsoft, you just keep on doing what you're doing. So, but going back to what Peter said, these are not pieces of paper. These are, these are live organisms. By the way, no one's asked a question yet, so I'm gonna keep that a warrant, I can keep talking. So at any rate, um, you can't eat relative bread. Uh, shorts or trades. Um, and hedge fund business, hedge funds have had a really hard time the last few years. And we're going to talk about this now because the Fed has completely tilted the playing field. Um, I don't, Tom may be the only other person in the room. I'm old enough to remember when we had the first pinball machines, mechanical ones, and when the ball wasn't doing what you wanted to, you kind of smacked it on the side or tilted it or whatever. Okay. Um, that's what these guys are doing with the stock market. Um, we've had the most expansive monetary regime in history, and stocks have gone from being just measures in terms of value of a company, just simply value on sales and earnings, to really a barometer for how much liquidity is in the system. So you saw PE ratios go to the moon and valuations which nobody foresaw. And think about it, in that type of environment, do you want to be short anything? No. So hedge funds did terribly because they were short. And in many cases, the shorts went up more than the longs because let's say we're all smart, we're all working hard. I suspect if Lee gave you an assignment and said, okay, I want you to analyze GameStop, AMC is a long or short, everyone in this room is going to figure out, oh, it's a short. And the problem is if we all go out and short it, and then something good happens, or the AMC apes, as they're called. I'm trying to get cool. I am on Twitter. I am, I am on Twitter, by the way. I have 19,000 followers. I was told six months ago I had to worry about my social media presence. I had 2,000 followers. I have 19,000 followers. So anyway, if the AMC apes don't like you, um, they'll play games with you. They'll, they'll engage in short squeezes, and they do. So shorting has been a very... Um, difficult proposition uh, in recent years. However, however, I'm happy to report in the last 12 months that has changed. I don't have the figures exactly in my head, but you know, even with the recent rally, I think the average NASDAQ stock is down something like 35 or 40% in the last 12 months. You look at the SPAC stocks, at the marijuana stocks, the meme stocks, at the IPOs, all the stuff that you'd see in Reddit and Wall Street bets and 
I'm sure all of you are in chat rooms and everyone's recommending this stock and that stock, okay? For a while, it was like Captain Stock Pickers, you're reigning supreme, just sort of dart against the wall, and we all look like a genius. Well, now that monetary policy is in the process of changing, that game is over. Um, and so, starting here, you've probably seen this before, it's just another version of it. This is the, um, uh, the Buffett indicator, it's just one indicator, and I've got other ones that we'll go over them. You can look at price to whatever you want, but just market cap to GDP is, and actually, this is this is at a date. This is this is a little over a year old. I have an updated graph, but that's even worse. I think it, it's 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 like another twenty percent higher than that. So, you know, if if if, if um, this is a level in markets, evaluation level in markets, which is not consistent with good positive returns going forward. And then if you look at the lower um, the lower one, and again a little bit out of date, but now it's even worse than it was then. You get the same idea. You can actually back test this if you look at um, if you use valuation as a forecasting tool, and it's not going to tell anything about what's happening the next month or the next year, that's the problem. Timing is always difficult. As Yogi Berra once said, you know, um, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Um, when you buy something at a, at a high valuation, all it's pretty much telling you that, because these things are mean reverting, pretty much with a high degree of certainty, you're not going to do so well over the next few years might do well the next year, the next two years, but over the next five, six, seven years, if you, if you believe in mean reversion, you're probably gonna lose money. Okay. So Lauren, I'm, I'm curious about the price. I agree with you that a lot of the bull market has been absolutely inspired by empirics, but we do the uh, policy. The question I have for you though is, how do you see a market correction be done in a way that actually benefits everyone? Because the truth of the matter is, right, if there is a correction after, Well, I, I have thoughts. I'm not sure I want to repeat them in polite company. Um, the problem is, oh, so I, I think the question is, what are my thoughts about a potential correction in the market? And how is that likely to affect people, especially given where the economy is and some people can lose their jobs? I think that was just the question. Yeah. Um, there is no way out. Let me give you an example. If you have a bond, which is yielding, so if you have a bond which is yielding um, 7%, Using the rule of 70, if you pay 54 now in 10 years, it'll be worth 100. So you know you're going to get 100 10 years from now. And let's say Fed Chairman Pinkwitz comes in and waves his magic wand. And now, because of QE and all this stuff, and the rates are now 2% instead of 7%. So if someone says to you, okay, well, this bond is still, what's not going to change is the bond's going to be worth 100 in 10 years. So if you take the net present value of that at 2% and discount that back, the bond may only be worth like 75, not 50. So you pushed up the price of the bond from 50 to 75. The payout's still the same. So all you've done really is, is stolen returns from the future. So by having easy money, yeah, we can all be happy about it because we're all getting, our net worth is increasing because stock price is going up. But you're stealing from the future. And it's not just, you know, grumbling, an active guy grumbling about this and how bad it is and it's unfair and all the active guys are making it. No, no, it's much worse than that. This is, you could teach a whole class on this. The misallocation of resources that's occurring as a result of this, um, you know, technology is a great thing. Capitalism is a great thing. I don't think we exactly have pure capital in this country, but that's a whole nother question. But competition is a good thing. But when you have bubbles and people start engaging in malinvestment, who is that benefiting? It's benefiting the shysters who are doing the IPO, but it's not serving any public good. I'm going to show you some graphs in a couple of minutes, which will graphically depict this point. And, you know, I don't really think. 
the world, you know, you look at the problems we have in this country today, I think we all agree we need more infrastructure and we don't make anything anymore and we need more investment and this and everything else. Do we really need another food delivery app company? Do we really need another Snapchat, you know, disappearing image? I mean, eh. so th these are what guys are raising, companies are raising money for. And with the SPACs, it's far worse. SPACs is like a blank check. So my, 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 to come back to your question, to, to tie it together, um, no, there's been a big misallocation of resources and, and easy money has been going on for so long that it's brought us inflation writ large. And that's why they're going to do something about it. That's why they are doing something about it. They have to. And I, I don't think there's any easy way. Out. You can't let this go on. And it's either, if, if you take, the only way you're going to stop inflation is by really, you know, having a restrictive monetary policy. You know, Paul Volcker, please call your office. Okay, we're not going to have that because everything's so politicized. So they're kind of like stuck. Like they don't want a bear market, but, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to take sides politically, but I think it is widely known that, you know, inflation has become a real issue for, the Biden administration, if you look at the polls, the lower 40% of the socioeconomic strata, they don't own stocks. They just know the price of gas is going. So anyway, point of all that is they're going to do something about inflation and the market's going to take it on the chin. I mean, the fat cats who made all their money in stocks the last 17 years, too bad. You had your turn. Now you got to stand aside. I think there was another question here. Yeah, and just uh, to follow up on that, though, I mean, you're saying that markets aren't really self-regulating, but I feel like so I think we're talking multiple time frames here. Yeah. Um, markets are self-correcting. But the problem is no one could have ever imagined, I didn't imagine, and not anybody would have a brain that I know imagined that it would have gone as far as it did, but it did. Um, I like to tell the story. Um, people use the term bubble a lot. What's the real definition of a bubble? Real definition of a bubble is something that changes people's behavior, causes them to do things they wouldn't do otherwise. So, you know, your friend is owning AMC or GameStop. And, you know, I was young once. It was, you know, AOL or whatever the heck it was back in the 90s. So it, it is nothing you want to do with sign. It's all human nature is the same. And so people start chasing things. It's like Peter said, oh, they're just buying because it's going up. They don't know what the company does. I mean, I think I, he didn't realize he was talking about AMC. Do you think anything, any AMC shareholders look at the balance sheet? So, but what happens is, you know, it self-corrects. Why? Because the more overpriced something becomes, the more supply it elicits. So it's like the old example, you know, you go to the store, price of bananas is too high, more guys are going to grow bananas. The price of bananas is too low, people are going to stop, you know. Right? So it does self-correct. The question is what a time frame. There are leads and legs. All right, let's move on. I want to go, sorry. Oh, please. Just quick follow-up on that. The market is in this state right now. Where would you allocate Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, I have some. I have. I have some. I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. Um, I have some slides we'll get into. Uh, I'll just. I'll just. I'll just hit and steal the fight. This is not. This is not investment advice. Do your own work. All right. But I have a thing for Kathy Woods. Okay. She makes me hot. All right, but in a bad way. I think she's a complete charlatan fraud. I, I'll wait till you see what I got for you. All right, okay. okay. The flip side of that is she epitomizes what's wrong with this market. All right, as well as I'm not supposed to talk about single stocks, but there's this multiple car company. So there's that one too. All right, he is a crook. He is a crook. All right. Um, um, don't get me started. I have no position, by the way, in electric car company because, because I got run over years ago in that one. We're going to talk about that. That's a great example, actually. I want to make a note to myself. I've got to talk about Tesla. Oops, I said it. Um, so I think the market is um, challenged. I think the market, um, you've probably heard the, 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 the term, you probably hear in finance prices, return free risk. Sorry, risk, return free risk. What's, what's, the, what's the, the yield of government securities? Well, I kind of have a play on words. To me, the stock market represents return-free risk. Again, return-free risk. I think it's got all downside and no upside because you've had maximum, we've had maximum everything. We had maximum monetary policy, maximum fiscal policy, maximum bond prices, maximum uh, individual investor participation, 
maximum liquidity. And now we're just going to have a little bit less of everything. And so that's going to cause prices to decline. Wait, wait, wait. That's totally. Okay, so so Bianca, you're gonna be sorry you brought that up. The only problem is I have like 90 charts. I gotta, I gotta, I'll have to go through all of them to find the, the the money money page. But you know, we are gonna zip through all of them just because I'm gonna say gotcha. Actually, the last point you raised is one of the reasons I'm I'm so bearish actually, because there was this idea before. Up until well, so let's back up time. All right, here's a question. Where, does anybody think this? Okay, I'll ask it a different way. Where, where do people think the stock market would be if we never had the pandemic? Would it be higher or lower? Why? There's too much money in the system, which is why the price of stocks is so high. So like stocks are expensive, bonds are expensive, real estate's expensive, crypto's expensive, baseball's expensive, everything is expensive, commodities are expensive. There's too much money in the system, we overcooked it. So without the pandemic, we would have never had this massive monetary stimulus, we would have never had this trillion, you know, what they ran, what was it, $3 trillion deficit two years ago or whatever, okay, we would have never had all that. And keep in mind, the public sector deficit is a private sector surplus. So the reason co individuals and companies have relative good balance sheets right now this is the government wrote all these checks. Now we got a problem. Inflation is going up. Anyone looking to see what bond yields are doing? We broke the 55 today on the 10 year. So to your point, Tom, I actually take what you say and I turn around and make it a negative because, because the idea used to be, oh, we can't raise rates very much because the system is so levered. If we do, it's going to blow up, blah, blah, blah. They can't do it. Now, Private economic actors, be it corporations or individuals, they have relatively good balance sheets. They can withstand the higher interest rates. So, okay, housing, we know mortgage rates have gone up a lot. Fine. That's the most interesting part of the economy. I get it. All right. My partner, that happens to be a big real estate agent, and I'm reliably told that it's just slowing things down. And for a lot of people, especially at the upper end, they're paying cash. There's just so much money around. So, um, I actually think, Tom, to your point, I think what it means is, whereas before, for a given level of interest rates, it might have brought on some odd job in terms of stress in the financial system. I think they can raise rates a lot, and I, and, and I believe that the effect is going to be far less than people imagine. I mean, seriously, look at corporations or individuals. If interest rates go up a percent, like, is that going to change anything, really? I mean, we are running such a massively stimulative policy right now. I don't even know where the Fed funds is. Right? I can't keep track of it. It's, it's like we got we have the biggest, the most negative real interest rates in the history of the world. So we're still running a very stimulative policy. So I think we can afford to raise rates. I think, and by the way, the Fed doesn't do anything really. They just follow. They engage in so-called open mouth operations, but the, but the Fed just follows. And so I think they've made it. People say, well, they might make a policy mistake. What do you mean they might make a policy mistake? What do you think they just did in the last few years? Um, so anyway, I mean, you know, unemployment's down to what is 3.6%, 3.7%, whatever it is. Um, and inflation's rocking and rolling, like, again, to channel my inner Jeremy Irons from uh, that great movie Margin Call, which I've seen like 10 times. I'm sure you most of you have to see it, you haven't seen it. So Mr. Bianco, Mr. Powell, I understand you, 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 you have some idea what's going on here. Could you please explain to me again why we have such low interest rates? Doesn't make any sense. There was another question here. Sure. When are you starting your next question? Are you saying right now we think that? Well, okay. So this, this I'm really glad the way this discussion is going. Not because I'm with myself talk, but I'm glad you guys are figuring it out. We've come through this period where active management has looked. You wanted to own the indices. And um, you know, value was out of favor. People wouldn't pay high prices for the someone who's a thinking active manager wouldn't pay up, pay these crazy valuations from these high flying stocks. But indexation, it's really just a large cap momentum strategy. And it has its own life cycle. And I don't know if we'll get to the charts got so many, but I think we're now coming to a period of time where active managers who 
And this goes down back to the title of the, the, the title of the room, which is you know long only, but which is long short. If you're a long, if you're if you're just a hedge fund guy, you don't care what the benchmark does. But let's, let's take Apple, all right? Great company. Seven percent of the S and P though. So I think on seven or eight times revenues, operating income is growing at like I don't know two or three percent or something like that. It's like on thirty times earnings. So if I was running just a hedge fund and I didn't care about the index, I would not waste my time with Apple. I'm not saying it's a bad company, it's a great company. I'm just saying, and we're gonna get to this as well, the difference between a stock and, and, and a company. You can have a great company like Apple, which can be a bad stock because it's overpriced. You can have a mediocre company, which is turning around, becoming a little less bad, and it can be a great stock. So going back to the question of, of hedge funds or, 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 or active management, two different things, I think um, this is a time when active managers um, will do relatively better. Um, you know, for me to come back, I want to, didn't answer the question that was asked earlier, what would I do? I have to like energy stocks very much. And I can talk about that later. So my sort of global view has been, um, you know, own things where there's been underinvestment. And so returns have fallen and it needs to attract more capital like energy we've had the last 15 years. And avoid things where there's been overinvestment, they've been up the prices, technology growth, Kathy Woods. So generally speaking, I do not like growth stocks. I do not like high PE stocks. I do not like loss making companies. And I want, and especially in a world where if rates go up, it's going to cause PEs to compress. Those stocks are going to get slammed. Even if the business is fine, go back to Tom's question. It's not about the business, it's about the valuation of the business. Meanwhile, in an environment of rising inflation, rising interest rates, you want to own price makers, not price takers. So an oil company, a copper company, a shipping company, something like that. And uh, I was going to ask if you lumped in commodities uh, and other hard assets. Uh, it, it, yes, uh, it's, it's all in the same. They're all they're all cousins of each other. I mean, you can argue, you know, you want like copper more than you like oil or whatever, but it's all basically the same idea. All right, let's move ahead here because I got a lot of ground I want to cover. Um, so the one here on the left, you can see that um, for the last different periods of time, the last three years for the Russell, the S&P, et cetera, um, of, of the return, you know, how much of the return was accounted for by a small percentage of large growth stocks. So if you didn't own Facebook, you didn't own Microsoft, you didn't own Apple, you were dead. You're just dead. I mean, it didn't matter how good Bianco Industries was or, 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 or Pinkwood's technology, nobody cared. All right, you had to own large cap growth. And you can see that by the, by, by the red bars. And by the way, these chickens are not coming home to roost because one of the slides I'll show later, um, you know, the growth funds are having a horrible time. And in particular, those who are most aggressive pursuing this growth mantra, the ARC funds getting destroyed. Um, just last week, Tiger Global came out with, they announced their first quarter numbers, they were down 34%. This follows a decline of 7% last year. I think they're bust and they just don't know it yet because so many of the companies in their portfolio are cash flow negative. And this is part of the problem of this whole cycle. A lot of companies came public and they shouldn't, they weren't ready to come public. They're cash flow negative. They need more money. They need to come back to the market. They can't stand on their own. So if prices start going down, it's a problem. Uh, I want to show you here in, in, in graph four, you can see, you know, this shows that um, this is a, a 30 year period from 1990. In the three year run up to um, the peak, you see large cap growth stocks did the best. Hedge funds who are doing market neutral did the worst. But then if you look at figure five, which is at the bottom, you can see for the three year returns following the peak, large cap growth does the worst down 30% annualized. It's no, uh, it's total just return. And, and the market neutral, um, the hedge fund thing does, does, does the best. And then if you take the full six years, both the three years before and after, um, you can see that because you have these big drawdowns with large cap growth names, you're worse off, even though it's intoxicating when it's doing really well. because It's like, oh, we're making all this money. Um, and then coming back, this now ties into long only versus long short. Um, if you look at, say, um, look, look at figure seven, where this had the HFRI market neutral index. These are, these are funds which are truly market neutral, no directional exposure. You can see it's a light blue line, how they were underperforming. Oh, sorry, they were they were um, uh, outperforming uh, from uh, summer of 2000. You put a dollar in the summer of 2000 by November of 08, 
you know, they were they were up, they were what, a dollar thirty-five, it looks like, and the SP was at 56 cents. And so it took it took it took 13 years before the market overtook the mar the, the market neutral hedge funds. And then down at the bottom, same thing. This is over a, a, a longer period of time. There are times when things are going really well, where the tortoises, the hedge funds, aren't looking so smart because the rabbit's way out in front, but the rabbit always slows down and comes back to the tortoise eventually. And right here, right now, today, you can just see how extended this period of time has been, how unusual it is. So don't get sucked in. Um, Cisco, this is a great example. I was actually short Cisco back in the day. So um, at the peak in 2000, Cisco was in 33 times sales. 33 times sales. There's that famous quote from Scott McNeely, which I have in here, where it talks about if you buy a company on 10 times revenues, so you're about 33 times revenues, 10 times revenues. Every dollar of revenues, forget about cost of goods sold, forget about it. Every dollar of revenues for the next 10 years would have to go in the form of dividends back to, 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 to the owner for him to just break even. It's insanity. At 10 times revenues. You routinely have companies now on 20 and 30 times revenues. I mean, this is just they're chasing dreams. So the point is, you know, Cisco, um, I have the numbers here. Let me just read from this. My, these, this data, by the way, comes from my, my good friends at uh, Kalish uh, Research. Um, they, um, uh, Matt Malgari, I used to work with him at Fidelity. Um, and so the amazing thing is, you can see Cisco went down, went from 33 times sales to three times sales. So you lost at 90% of your money, okay? 87% 87, 87 of your money at the trough, all right? And it took you, I think, 13 years, 20 years just to get, to get back to break even. But the crazy thing is during that period of time, those 20 years, they got back to break even. Revenues were up 172%. And, and, and earnings per share went up by 681%. So it's like I said before, there's a difference between a stock and a company. You know, I think it's, uh, was it Warren Buffett who said, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And then what Matt did here, if you look at the, 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 the table on the right, you can see there, we'll name names. Okay, so friends, let's go back to the one on the left. You probably recognize, he did this study like a year ago. I think this was, this was uh, in 2021. He picked out a whole bunch of stocks which were on over 33 times sales. Um, these are predominantly loss making. And you can see in the, in the, in the right-hand column over here, all right, the average stock went down 28%. These are all names we would recognize. Um, today, just to update this, he did it again, all right? These are all stocks we know. Snowflake, I mean, Snowflake. I don't, maybe after class, someone can explain what Snowflake does. I don't understand. All right. I do know it's on 60, it's on 50 or 60 times revenues, which to me is just insanity. So in any event, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to lose money in these names. And if you look at the, at the index he put up there, um, he, he just he has the Kalish Research Index of, of, of the five or some high price stocks. You can see that they've gone down 30% and the you know, S&P's kind of just rolling over a little bit. But this is a fool's game. People are chasing dreams. Um, I'm going to speed up now. So uh, just, I just want to rip through these. I got all the interesting charts I want to show you. Please interrupt me if you have a question. Um, this is what happens when you buy stocks on 20 times on 20 times sales. 55% of the companies 10 years later have been delisted. Delisted. <laughs> you know, but it was a good story when you bought it. Okay. Um, and then and then it shows you up here on the right. The average forward, the, the, the chance you have of being in the market, if you buy a stock on over 20 times sales, is on a three-year basis, only 23%. And then if you look at the excess returns of, of, of stocks on over 20 times sales, it's a loser's game. Like, why would you do that? I mean, forget about how good the story is. Why would you do that? I mean, it was what do they say? Liars figure, but figures don't lie. Um, and then this goes to what we're talking about before the last few years. Since the great financial crisis, where we've just been flooding the system with money, uh, the S&P 500 total return is 950%. The earnings only went up 200%. Problem. Problem. So this is forms the basis of why I'm so negative on the stock market. It, with, with respect to my friend Tom, it's got nothing to do with the companies themselves. It's just the prices people are paying are nuts. All right, now we're going to flip through a couple of, this is here. 
This just shows, I'm just going to flip through these things, not in any particular order, the order I got them loaded into, but whatever. Um, if I have more time, you've been organized. This speaks to how irresponsible um, the Fed is being. Um, this is actually understates it, in my opinion, but you've got negative real interest rates, um, which makes everything else look relatively attractive. But as we see, interest rates are going up, and I think they continue to go up. So this whole idea of Tina, there's no other alternative. No, there is an alternative now. I think fully a third of the stocks in the S&P are yielding more than um, bonds. And so if the 10 year keeps going up and I expect it will, this is gonna provide increasing uh, competition for equities. Um, this is what happens. And again, this is gonna be an oddball order. It's gonna go really quickly, sort of like a Rorschach test. This just shows you over time, uh, circumstances to the friends at Strategus, to, and I apologize for the order of the slides. Um, stocks like low inflation, the sweet spot zero to 2%, which is kind of what we had. They don't like deflation because that conjures up other problems, but they don't like high inflation either. Right now, by the way, inflation is whatever it is, 8%, and it's going higher. Oil prices are continuing to go up. Wages are continuing to accelerate. We're importing inflation because supply chain issues. ESG, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I think inflation is, you know, is it peaking? Yeah, it might be. It's not the right question. The right question is, is it going to be, is it going to be high for a sustained period of time? And might it go higher? And I think the answer is yes. And so the idea that, you know, without getting crazy, a year from now, inflation could still be six or seven percent, totally possible. Put that in your dividend discount model and see what happens. Uh, in so now what happens? Go back to the 70s when we had stagflation. I don't want to really use the word stagflation. This comes from one of my favorite analysts, Michael Harden at um, Merrill Lynch. And you see what tends to do well in an environment of um, stagflation. If you look over on the far right, what does the worst, I mean, obviously utilities because inflation is an issue, but tech, consumer discretionary, telco, so industrial. So to go back to the question that was asked earlier, like what would I buy? What I would not buy is I would avoid consumer discretionary stocks like the plague. Real incomes are going to get squeezed by rising inflation. Also, there's an element I think of revenge shopping that, is, that took place, the comps are really, really hard now. And I think a lot of companies believe around are gonna line up with excess inventories. It's impossible in a retail company in this environment. So I think it's consumer discretionary is, 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 is no fly zone for me. Um, I think tech is a disaster. Um, now, and, and the flip side of it is going back to, you wanna own, um, you wanna own, you know, value tends to do better, energy does better, real estate does better, et cetera, et cetera. So a total is so in other words, the world we're talking about, what we've already seen the last nine months, a year, is totally different from what we saw the prior five years. And I think we're going to see more of this is my point. All right, energy. Um, I'm sorry again, this is in a weird order. So this is just this is just uh, the relative price of energy going back a long time. And you can see the scale really kind of doesn't do it justice, just what a disaster energy was. Uh, from say 2008 or nine. I mean, price of oil got up to 147.50 in 2008 and then it went negative a couple of years ago. So oil stocks got absolutely schmiced. I remember when I first started at Fidelity's summer intern in 1980, um, they gave the junior oil stocks to the other guy. That was the hot cool. I think energy got up to, I can't remember, it was 15% or 20% S&P, some big number. It went all the way down to two. Now it's three. 3% of the market, but guess what? 7% of earnings. So if energy companies just sold at a market multiple, which they don't or won't, well, I hope they will. Actually, I do hope they will. Even if you're into ESG, I'll tell you why. The only way to solve this is you gotta let the market solve it. You need high prices. Solution for high prices is high prices. By beating up the energy companies and forcing them to divest assets and not put another hole in the ground and pay higher dividends and so on and so forth. We're just making the situation worse. And these companies are gonna make a fortune. So right now, energy companies account for about 7% of the index earnings, but they're only about 3.5% of the index itself. Um, I'm just gonna flip to this quickly. This just shows, I mean, this just compares the, the valuations of, 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 of these different industries um, compared to their history. And you can see energy selling a big discount for where it has historically where tech and consumer discretion uh, is not. Please, uh, go for it. So I have a funny uh, 
picture. You know, if I had this in order, you would see it now. Um, the energy situation has little to do with Russia. Um, we've had massive underinvestment in energy since 2014. Capital expenditures in real terms have gone down by like 70%. It's been exacerbated in recent years by the ESG pressures. And so the thing about energy, the thing about oil, it's usually not the demand side, which is the issue. Demand for oil has only gone down three years in the last 50. It's usually the supply side. And the thing about energy, you have to keep in mind, it has a, there's a depletion rate in the production of about 5% a year. So if you don't invest, your production is gonna go down like 5% every year. So what's happened is very little investment for the last eight years or so. So the amount of supply that's available is, is, is you know, we're not, we're not drilling for new oil. In fact, if you look, I don't have the numbers to hand, but something like, I think we have like 12 years of reserves right now. That number was considerably higher a few years ago. I have to check with my oil and oil and friends to get the number. I forget what it was. But we are, we are running headlong into an energy crisis. And this, this Russia situation is tragic. And by the way, if anybody cares, and I'm not showing for myself, I get no monetary benefit from this, but um, I've been doing these Twitter spaces um, lately. I kind of backed into um, becoming a talking head and it's become really, really successful. And just the other day we set up a YouTube channel and people have been really interested in these uh, talks I give. Um, people will listen to three and four hours. It's just unbelievable. In any event, I don't charge for it. But what we're doing is we're trying to monetize it, and we set up a um, we set up a uh, GoFundMe page. And uh, my friend Andrew here has been working with me, um, and we're trying to get people to give. It's like, hey, you know, you're not paying for this research, but would you consider giving a gift to help the people in Ukraine? In particular, we uh, we, we we selected uh, World Central Kitchen, I think is the name, as a charity. So um, um, so anyway, you were asking about energy. So so energy, I think, is. Uh, it's my favorite sector by far. It has a little to do with what's going on in Russia. Price of oil was a hundred bucks before Russia ever was a thing. Yes, question. I like the EMP and particularly the Canadian EMP because they have longer reserves, slower depreciation rates, lower costs, um, and also the Canadian dollar has been very weak. Uh, Midstream will do well. It will certainly be better than the market, and it's got a nice yield. Um, interestingly, usually when energy does well, a little service does really well because the guys making the equipment can, can, can charge higher prices. Those stocks haven't done really that well the last few years. In part because the bull case on energy had was predicated upon the fact that we wouldn't get much more production. But if the solution is going to is going to include more production, eventually the, the service guys have to do well. So those stocks have started to do better. And I would say to those in the room who are concerned about ESG things, I mean, look, even something like natural gas, which is like one millionth as bad as oil, that's the bridge fuel to the future. And I don't want to get into politics, but if you get really dogmatic about this, and it's like, if it's got carbon, we don't want anything to do with it. I mean, the Europeans are committing economic suicide right now. It is insane what they're doing. Totally insane. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a crisis. There's an old, there's a phrase I learned back with this guy, Andrew Smithers from years ago, who was an advisor to S.G. Warburg. He had something, went something like, without action, there's crisis. There's going to be a crisis since there is no crisis. Since, since there is no action, we're going to, anyway, the point of it is, it's going to take a full blown disaster to get people to change their minds. And I think, you know, just as an aside, um, when people say, oh, well, so high, it's $110 and blah, blah, blah. Well, the guy I rely I try to predict oil prices is a fool's errand, but the guy I rely on the most, and he does some really good work, Mike Rothman, he used to be at Merrill Lynch, he's now on his own. And if you look at the percentage of GDP devoted to energy, which is coincide with past recessions, it's like I think six percent or something like that. We're only at four right now, and so you, like gas could go like like oil could go like one hundred eighty dollars a barrel, which would translate that into at the pump would be over six dollars. 
Um, or another way of looking at it in real terms, if you look at where oil peaked in 2008 and just adjust for inflation, you come up with kind of a similar number. So if you think oil prices are high now, just wait. Yep, I got it. All right, let me just go real quick. I'm, I'm just going to go through it. Okay. All right, so let's go to Kathy Wood. We have to talk about her, okay? <laughs> All right. She is the poster child for everything that's wrong in the stock market. And no, I don't want to be accused of being a misogynist. I was around when Garrett Von Wagner, male, Alberto, Alberto Villar, male, convicted felon, Ryan Jacob, male, um, uh, Kevin Landis, first-hand fund, male. It was the same nonsense back in, in 1999 and 2000. There's always a Cassandra, ooh, great story, okay. She has been a masterful marketer, I'll give her that, but I know people that have worked with her. She does horrible analysis. I can tell you that myself from looking at the research they put. Horrible analysis and doesn't care at all about risk. And it's funny, you look at when these when the, this thing came out, it's the old magazine indicator uh, thing you've heard about before. This is May of last year. So I've been short on My favorite trade, one thing, if you just want one trade. And again, you're on your own, don't come back to me, but I think being long energy, if you say which ones, I would just buy the XOP, which is the ETF for uh, exploration production, and I'd short her. Or if you don't want, or, or if you don't like going short, there's this thing called SARC, which is the inverse ETF. And the funny thing is, it's done so well. I haven't checked it the last couple of weeks, but ARC went down so much and SARC went up so much that SARC actually got to be a higher price than ARC. So then people are getting really clever on Twitter. So they go, so, okay, so now is ARC the inverse ETF for SARC? Anyway. <laughs> So I think she is she is destroying capital. She has lost more money than any fund manager in the world the last couple of years for their investors. How could that be? Because, all right. Um, <laughs> I, I had this one for Tesla, but it, it, it's, it's, this is the joke that never gets old. So anyway, um, the problem is people put money at the top. It's like, go back to Magellan Fund. If you look at if you look at Peter Lynch's returns, 29% a year over 12 years, those are time-weighted returns, those aren't dollar-weighted returns. But everyone gets FOMO. It's not just kids today, everyone gets FOMO all the time. So everyone goes piling at the top and panicking at the bottom. So if you looked at the dollar-weighted return of the average investor in Magellan Fund, it was like, I don't know, 5% or some crazy low number like that. So the point of it is, if you look at when she took in all the money, even though she was up a zillion percent the last few years, she has lost money for investors. Because it all came in at the top. She has collected her fees. She certainly has. Where does it hurt? <laughs> and she had the temerity, okay? When her stocks were blowing up a couple months ago, all right, I actually made a, I made this up. I know, I know, how, to, <laughs> I know how to use the meme generator, okay? <laughs> all right? It's worse. You're really, you're very fortunate because I was about, I was about to, I think Tom knows about this. If you guys don't know this, go look up Mad Money Sound Sound Bar on the internet. You can find it. It's all the annoying things that Kramer does. Sell, sell, sell. Bye, bye. Sell, pain. Okay. I have those buttons. I was almost going to bring it to this lecture, but I thought that, <laughs> that just would have been too much, right? So anyway, I mean, energy, energy's crazy cheap, and the prices keep going up. All right. So here she is. Uh, notice, I did this last year. All right. Okay. I did this last year. That's how old this thing is. Or right? is it 120? I think she's 65 now. Uh, okay, so just we're in the market. One thing to keep in mind, nothing goes in a straight line. John Roke is going to be speaking here next week. He is fantastic. He's much better than I am. This is from him. He, nothing goes in a straight line, even in the bear market of 2000, 2002, uh, when tech went down 80%. There were uh, uh, 15 counter trend rallies at 10% or more, uh, 10 counter trend rallies at 15% or more. And I think 47% of the days the market was actually up. So the last two weeks, oh, there's going to be peace in Russia. And oh, you know, the Fed raising rates is already discounted. And oh, oil prices are peaking. And then someone puts up a graph of, you know, container rates. Oh, inflation is going to go down. And so what happens? All the guys that get short get yanked. They all cover their shorts. Some of the Momo guys pile in. So you're saying there's a chance, all right? And then what happens? Whoops, back into the breach again. So that's kind of wash, rinse, repeat. That's the way it rolls. Okay, not any more importance. Next time I'm going to get these graphs. It's like never, some Carolina graduate never do say what you can put off till tomorrow. So this speaks to 
overvaluation. I mean, look at this. Look at this. All right. Number of startups valued over a billion dollars per year. Like which line isn't like any other line? Is that a top anyone? Okay. Retail trading. All right. Look at this. The blue line. Okay. Retail trading. This, this is the gamification, memification of the stock market. Retail trading. All right. Accounts for almost as much as mutual funds and hedge funds combined. Which is, you know, the index index funds have kind of taken over the market, et cetera, et cetera. Let me just go real quickly here. We've been over. All right. So again, why are rates so low? And I have some questions I have to answer here. So I'm just race through this. Everyone piled in last year, and the market went down. In fact, everyone piled in last year. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? They put all the money in, and the market went down. What does that tell you? Okay. Cycle of psychology, John Roke again, this is the last thing. He'll probably show this graph. So when he comes next week, he's already saw this, right? <laughs> I think we're in the early phases, like the second or third inning of the commodity rally. I've ever asked the question more about commodities. They're undervalued, underowned. No one likes them. Tech, on the other hand, everybody's in. Tech, by the way, properly defined, John Roke, he'll have a graph on this. It's 45% of the market. Because if you just look at the tech index, it doesn't include the sneaking. They sneak some things in there. Amazon, my grad technology, it's now consumer discretionary, and like Netflix is in communication. So tech is like 45% of the, uh, of, of, of the market. Zombie companies, again, for my friends at Kalish. I mean, look at this. There's $6 trillion, this is a little bit out of date, it's less now, of companies with that earnings were interested in taxes, less than earnings expense. Like you can't make this stuff up. Left-hand graph, and again, I wish I had this in better order. I'm just trying to make you guys think. Um, look, at, look at the central bank balance sheet, which is, which is dark blue line, and then the market cap of the FANG stocks goes hand in hand. All right, this one is really good. This is a show stock. We go through these regime changes. This is a very important. This is one of the most important ones. I should have put this up at the front. This shows you by decade how the changes in global leadership change. And there's always a narrative with it. Oh, in the 80s, running out of oil. In the 90s, oh, Japan's going to take over everything. In, tech, in 2000, oh, it's technology going to take over everything. 2010, it's all resources and energy. And, and this has been updated, okay, but it's, it's technology now. So it's wash, rinse, repeat. There's nothing new under the sun, trust me. That's the way capitalism works. This just shows divergence between energy and tech. You've seen this. Again, uh, why, why are Fed funds on the floor? Okay, this is a really good one. This, this kind of better presents what I showed earlier. The, the the sort of inverse correlation between uh, yields and PE ratios. Okay, sure. this is Tesla. This is this shows the valuation of Tesla. Uh, enterprise value to sales because they hardly make any money. It's gone from like three times sales to twenty two times sales. This is a bubble. Um, Arc we talked about her before. I mean overlays don't prove anything, but it's tracing out very nicely the Nasdaq bust. Okay, and this, okay, this is the trade I like. This is my trade. This is the long XOP and short technology. And you can see the ratio uh, at the bottom. It bottomed at 0.14 uh, back in 2020. It's now up to 0.38. But look where it's got a lot further to go. Here's XOP against ARC. It's got even further to go. All right, I'm going to stop because that's enough. There were a few questions and then we got two minutes left. I just want to go back to some of the questions that were asked. Um, emerging market risk, uh, EM debt. I think we're going to be in an environment of increasing economic volatility and stresses and strains. So I tend to stay away from it. Can the Fed do anything about inflation? Yes, if they want to give us a recession. Otherwise, no. They can't grow more wheat. They can't make more oil. Um, how would I structure a long short portfolio? You don't really want to get net short. I've done that a lot of times in my career and it never works, but um, it's, it's not even so much, are you 0% or 10% net long and net short? It's what, what are you long and what are you short? So it could be your gross exposure, not your net exposures. If you said to me, hey, you know, George, you're 50% long energy and 50% short Kathy Woods, that could be a more risky proposition than something that's just say long the market. So sometimes the gross is your enemy. It's not just the net. There's one other one. Uh, here we go. Active versus passive. Oh, the 60 40 portfolio? Dead. 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 I mean, I, I would own gold. I own volatility. I own something else. I mean, you got to be nuts to own bonds in this environment. Thank you.